Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, we have a really important episode, a, a sort of call to action episode surrounding the story of the Pendleton Two. We have on as our guest uh, Two Black, who has done a lot of work with the Pendleton Two and a lot of work with the Black Alliance for Peace, uh, the Defense Committee to Free the Pendleton Two, and uh, is a poet, puts together documentaries. Um, we've had him on actually, uh, I think earlier this year, um, in May of, of this year, uh, with his with his co with his co-author Razul Mowat to talk about their book that they, they released this year called Laundering Black Rage: The Washing of Black Death, People, Property, and Profits. So uh, that interview was was really important, and um, I'll link that that interview in the show notes so you can go check that out. Um, definitely, it was a, it was a great episode. And while we're on the topic of, of political prisoners, I just want to remind people that a couple years ago in 2021, we did an interview with uh, Kevin Rashid Johnson of the revolutionary intercommunalist Black Panther Party um, from prison, who he's, he's still in prison. And uh, we got the first person sort of perspective of what what prison is, how the prison guards behave, the racial dynamics of maximum security prisons, the the torture of solitary confinement, etc. So I, I thought that was an interesting interview that this one sort of reminded me of um, as the as the broader critique, the abolitionist and radical revolutionary critique of the racist American political prison system is advanced in this episode as well, as it was in, in that one. So these it's really important to just educate yourself about that, help other people educate themselves about that. I also wanted to make sure, and I, I make this clear throughout the episode, but this is a call to action. So the, he's going to tell you the story of the Pendleton 2, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be heartbreaking, it's going to be enraging, as these stories always are. Um, but don't just let it stop there. Um, I want people to, to do whatever they can to directly help the Pendleton 2. And of course, that comes in the form of donating directly, which I'll link to in the show notes, but it also comes in many other forms. We talk about the, the multiple ways that you can help spread the word. You can spread this podcast. There's a documentary um, that, that Two Black and um, his, his friend King Trill put out through Breakthrough News. We'll probably play a clip of that in the episode itself, but the, the full documentary will be linked in the show notes. And one of the ways I think that would be cool to to help out is to do a screening Um, and and two black tells you at the end of this episode exactly how to do that so if you're in an organization um, putting on a a screening in your local city or town to educate um, people in your community about this issue and your organization about this issue is another way to spread the word um, contribute to the cause etc so um, yes i want people to learn the story and i want people to act on it in whatever ways that they can um, whether that's sharing, donating directly, organizing something around this issue, etc. And um, huge shout out to the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, they're just wrapping up their Black August events, and we talk about that in the end of the show as well, and how people can e- either directly join or um, sh- show support or join the Solidarity Network of the Black Alliance um, for Peace, which, again, does amazing, amazing work. And I've had on members of, of that organization on the show many, many, many times. And I hope to continue to have them on the show many times going forward. Because as I say, in almost every episode where they're on, they are one of the most principled um, you know, political organizations out there in the United States today. So show them some love for sure. All right. And without further ado, here is me and Two Black discussing the case of the Pendleton Two, um, Black Alliance for Peace's Black August, and much, much more. Enjoy. Yeah, I'm, I go by Two Black. I'm a poet, a filmmaker, scholar, and organizer uh, based in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm here today to speak on the case of the Pendleton Two. Some of you may have heard me prior with my co-author, uh, Russell Mawat, speak on our book that just dropped in April, Laundry and Black Rage. Um, but today we're here to talk about political prisoners and specifically the Pendleton Two. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you back. And um, I will make sure to link to our previous episode with you and your co-author laundering black rage in the in the comments or in the show notes so people can find that episode and listen to it if they if in case they missed it but yes today we're talking about the Pendleton 2 uh, this is a really important case that actually through this 
um, engagement with you, it was brought to my attention for the first time. I don't know how it slipped through my awareness. But if it slipped through my awareness, I assume there are many people out there who are also unaware of the situation. So we're going to try to correct that today with this episode. So let's start with just that, the Pendleton 2. John Balagoon Cole and Christopher Naeem Trotter. Um, can you tell us the backstory of the incident that, that occurred with Lincoln Love and in the 1980s and his brutalization at the hands of correction officers? And just kind of tell us what John and Christopher's role was in the incident, etc. Just give us a nice background of, of what actually occurred, and then we can get into more contemporary uh, developments. Right, so um, I always try to go back to the... Um, give people a sense of the prison that they were in and just like kind of the nature of that place. Cause I think that helps people understand more so how the incident that we're going to speak about, how that was, how that was sparked and how that wasn't really an accident. Um, so there, this is Indiana reformatory, what we now know as the, um, in, as the Pendleton correctional facility in, in, in Indiana, based in uh, Madison County, Indiana, the biggest city in Madison County is Anderson for the few people who might be familiar with um, Indiana <clears throat> is the prison that was built, I believe in the thirties, um, actually in the twenties, 1923. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it comes in a time where, you know, these prisons are trying to prisons that used to just be holding places for basically executions, <laughs> uh, like death, executions, hangings, things of that nature. And then, you know, eventually prisons quote unquote reform themselves to be places where people can be rehabilitate or in as, as is in the name of reformatory. So people can be reformed from whatever quote unquote crime they committed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so by, you know, the 1960s, uh, the late 1960s, you know, this prison, um, has now started to uh, get a, a, a large share of black, of black prisoners and inmates, and there was a a protest done by the black prisoners because they were being treated so horribly by the guards and even by the white prisoners in 1969. This was a silent protest, this, and it was a nonviolent protest. They uh, about 100 black men simply you just sat down in the in the uh, yard and said, "We're not going back into our cells until you know we can end the." the level of mistreatment and discrimination that we have to deal with and the brutality we have to deal with. And the guards, just to give, again, to give people a sense of what kind of prison we're dealing with, those guards um, took that demand and decided to shoot into the crowd of 100 black men that were just sitting in the yard who were not bothering anyone. They shot into the yard. Um, guards, I think, as I'm reading here, fired live rounds indiscriminately, um, and they killed one person and wounded about 47 of them, but just shooting into this crowd. So this is the kind of prison just to give people a sense of what you're dealing with. Um, there was a class action lawsuit that came through um, in the mid eighties that talked about um, what was happening in the early eighties. It says uh, by 1982, the, the, um, this is speaking of the space in the prison. Um, it housed almost 2000 prisoners, but it was, but it was twice its intended capacity. So it was overcrowded. Uh, to accommodate the rise of population, prison officials placed two prisoners in cells that were intended for one. More than one third of all cells were converted into double cells. So, again, prisons are not great places, period. But now you have people in like basically sardine cans shoved into cells that are, you know, that are are half the size they should be in cells that are meant for one person having two people in it. Um, the the um, segregation units were so bad it said they were about 24 square feet net, approximately half of that. So it's only 12 square feet cells. Prisoners were kept who need to be separated from general population. That's what these cells were for. The, the ceilings were lower and the inmates on the top bunks of double cells were, were unable to sit up. So people had back problems because if you were in a double cell in a in the segregation unit, you couldn't even sit up. So some people couldn't even stand. Um, there was no space for a chair on the floor. That's how small these places were. Um, the kitchen and the commissary and the food storage areas were unsanitary and infested with mice and roaches, and the floor was found uncleanable due to holes, cracks, crevices, missing tile, and gross porosity. Some of the ceiling was missing. Pots and pans were covered with uncleanable grim. So I, this is from a lawsuit, um, French for it's just all in a class action lawsuit that the prisoners actually 
um, hit hit the uh, <clears throat> hit hit Indiana Reformatory with. So when I always give, I always like to give people that little bit of a backdrop as to what the prison was, yeah. because it's, I think sometimes we, you know, and I know this show was worked through like Lennon and stuff, and this 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 issue of spontaneity. And sometimes people, and it, you know, Lennon was very critical of people who like to think of spontaneity as this kind of random occurrence. Now, you know, he obviously. He talked about Vanguard and things of that nature, but also just this idea that folks just randomly get mad one day and conditions are not really a part of it other than maybe one incident, like somebody got beat up or something happened. It's like, no, that's just the, that's the, as they say, the last straw that is not a, that doesn't come out of nowhere. If everything was peaceful and then somebody was abused or something, I don't think everybody would want to, you know, take over a prison. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you put people in prison, when you shoot in the crowds of black men sitting in protests, when you, you know, serve them slime on plates and you have them stuffed in cells and then the cells are unclean and, and, you know, folks can't get cleaning supplies. They can't get soap. They can't get the basic things to take care of themselves. And then on top of it, you have, and we're going to get to this more, a racist guard unit, um, that is beating up prisoners and targeting black prisoners. You know, it's 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 fairly logical that one day, you know, there was going to be some response to that. You know, like, that's not really hard to conceive of. Um, so that's this just to give people a sense, and there's more, but just to give people a sense of what Indiana Reformatory was like. So on 1985, um, February 1st, 1985, this is when the actual uprising takes place. Um, as I said, this is a prison that is already seized with all these seized with all these um all these all these plagues and um mistreatments right so there was a prisoner by the name of Lincoln Love aka Lokmar um he was a jailhouse lawyer he helped fellow prisoners he got people out um all the time and he mostly did this for free and he was part of a broader group maybe we can talk about more later that was called the Black Dragons which I just recently learned through doing more research, talking to more prisoners, it was actually an offshoot of the uh, Black Gorilla family, which is um, was was founded by George Jackson. Mm, yeah. uh, <clears throat> so it was a chapter of that. So there was Black Dragons was a group that protects that protected each other, had self defense, had political education classes. They actually did the rehabilitation that the prison wasn't doing. Um, if you listen to that interview I just did with Naeem, he talks about some of this. Um, so, you know, they had they had organized inside prison in response to these conditions. So Lincoln Love was one of the leaders of this group, one of the most well respected prisoners, but also was someone who didn't who didn't back down, who got into it with guards who beat him who would try to beat on him or you know, he did he wasn't somebody that just took it laying down. So he ends up in what's called the the MRU or the maximum restraint unit, and that's where he is at this day, this early morning. Um so the the prisoner guards um, what we later learned, uh, as I was saying, with the racist guards, were actually part of a splinter cell Ku Klux Klan group um, called the Sons of Light. This was confessed to by uh, Michael Richardson, who was there that day um, and who was part of this incident that I'm about to describe. And we can, uh, can we can round back to all this. I know there's a lot of information, but I just want to drop these seeds so we can expand on them later. Um, so the guards began searching the cells in the embryo. They searched them multiple times. There's a note in the documentary, the guard that normally was over the MRU, who according to testimony was a fair was was as fair as you were gonna get within this context, did not really indiscriminately target anyone. He kept the unit pretty cool. He did not work that morning. Um and so these guards come in without the general uh leadership that was that was supposed to be there, and they start targeting cells, flipping cells, have everybody stripped down to just shorts and water shoes and um <clears throat> shower shoes, excuse me. And then um and then there's a lawsuit at the time that describes a beating. They 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 hover around Lincoln Love's cell. They got on their all their equipment, their billy clubs and their helmets and their shields. And they so they tear gas his cell. Then they handcuff him. Then they rush in there and then according to this lawsuit and, and eyewitness accounts as well. They maliciously held him down and beat him unmercifully, stomped and kicked the inmate all over his body and hit the inmate upon and about his upper body and head with nightsticks. 
Um, I've even read elsewhere that it was this is such a small cell. Some of the guards stood on his bed because there wasn't a space for them all in the cell. Stood in his bed to beat him, um, you know. And these were nightclubs that were considered you know, night sticks that were considered illegal at the time. So after he was beaten, he's dragged out of his cell by his face um, on the ground, like dragging him. There are people around are watching this. You know, now they're yelling down to the, the prisoners are yelling down out to the regular population, which is not the same as MRU saying they're trying to kill us in here. Because it was the understanding that he was either dead or he was about to be killed because they had beaten him nearly to death. Um, so this is where uh, the penitents who start to come in. So originally it was uh, Balagoon who hears this because he was already near the unit because uh, he was considered a, um, I always forget the term, a, um, <laughs> I can't remember the term I was talking about. It was basically a, uh, a, someone who will come and, and look out for folks uh, who are going, who are trying to, who are being disciplined, a lay advocate. Sorry. I couldn't mm. remember. He was a lay advocate at the time. A lay advocate inside prison is somebody who will testify to your conduct and, you know, obviously help to get you, you know, in good standing. So he was going up to this unit at the time and he hears this beating and he hears him yelling down, yo, they're trying to kill us down here. They're trying to kill us down here. So he goes back to, um, he goes to see where the, where Lincoln Love was. They had taken him to the um, captain's office, and he said there was this curtain that was pulled in the and the um, the understanding by the prisoners was if, if this curtain was pulled, that that meant somebody was getting beat. That meant somebody was getting beaten up. They would pull the curtain and they well on him. And this was verified when you read Michael Richardson again, who was involved in this, who was actually the person who handcuffed Lincoln Love. He. Um, he said that they were they were they continued welling on him, and, and he said the order was to quote kill the son of a bitch. Mm. So this was this was what was going to happen. So Balagoon can't really see what's going on; they won't let him in. So he goes and gets several other prisoners and comes back, and that's where uh, Christopher Naim Trotter gets involved. Um, and it's important to note at this time Balagoon only has three years left, and Naim only had three months left on their sentence. So yeah. this is they could they easily could have not have been involved in this if they didn't if they wanted to go home. So they go to the captain's office to see what's going on. They are not allowed to see anything. They try to push through to, to see where he's at. They are then attacked by the guards because um, originally they did not approach this in a violent way. They were attacked by the guards. They moved to defend themselves. Um, they fight off the guards in this area. And then, they're, and then at this point, the prison is being is on red alert. They're trying to swarm these prisoners who were you know, there's a now it's an uprising, now there's a melee, and there's fights. So they're running towards the infirmary because they're still trying to see where Lincoln Love is. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't actually know fully where he is. There's reports that at a certain point he had actually been transferred, but they don't know where he's at. Um, they they're, they're thinking he's in the infirmary. As they get to the infirmary, this is already after being chased by trucks. After you know there was snipers on the roof. And once they get to the infirmary, then they get corralled in the infirmary by all the guards. And now they said the the guards was the order was to kill them, mm-hmm. not just Lincoln Love, but they have at least successfully taken the attention off Lincoln Love, who probably would have been killed. And now they had to fight their way out of this infirmary, they fight their way out of the infirmary. They have their weapons, they have their knives, they had to stab them to get out. Now this is where the court tries to say that they didn't act in self defense, but they literally did mm-hmm. um, to to get away from all these guards, um, Naeem takes uh, one of the hostages and gets them to, one takes one of the guards hostage and gets him to open the, um, what's called cell house J at the time. They, he opens it, they slip into the cell house, take several hostages and they seal off in there. And there is a lockdown for about 15, 16 hours. Mm. Um, During this time, they actually put the hostages in cells. They let all the, the prisoners out of cells, put the hostages in cells, and protect them so the guards cannot kill the hostages. Mm-hmm. Not just because they care about the lives of the hostages, but they also care about the lives of their fellow prisoners because they understand that if this would have occurred, like if they had killed him, and you know, we'll probably talk about Attica at some point, um, you know, Attica, part of what made that go so bad was one guard ends up dying in the state under Nelson Rockefeller didn't even care about the other prison guards and shot through them to kill the prisoners, right? Mm-hmm. Like this... So they understood that if someone dies, like the state will use this possibly as a means to kill and slaughter everyone. 
Yeah. They didn't want that to happen. So they protected the lives of the guards. That's why it's ridiculous that they're still in prison to this day for as if they were attempting to murder someone. Mm -hmm. Um, They have a list of demands um, and grievances that they wanted to share because um, they took this as a moment to try to improve the conditions inside the prison. So they had um, the end of censorship and letters of media, the ability to be politically active without reprisal, the establishment of minimum wage for inmates, the establishment of grievance committees for prisoners to safely bring forward issues to the DOC without fear of intimidation, threats, beatings, or any punishment by guards. And if you look in the documentary, we have the sheet of those original demands. Uh, at this time, the media had been called. So the Indianapolis Star and the Indianapolis Reporter, which is a black newspaper, were present to help with these negotiations. Um, they had also even called black radio stations. Um, eventually, they get their demands met. And then the one of the ones was no no reprisal, <laughs> which, you know, did not happen. Um, and they're they're led back into their cells. And they, and I remember, I think Mika said for a brief moment, it felt like things were going to change. And then next thing you know, they're all put in lockdown. They start transferring some of the different prisoners who were involved, um, you know, to different prisons. They're in the hole for, I think Mika said, Mika was not the Pendleton too, but he was one of the, Charles Murphy, he was one of the people involved in the uprising. Um, he was in there for three years. Jesus. Um, they get to 1987, they have a trial, um, and uh, John Battle, who we call and Christopher Knight trial, who we call the penalty two again, are uh, trial. Um, the trial was just nonsense. The um, the prosecutor openly fraternized with the jurors. Um, there's evidence that the jurors were knew some of the guards who were in the prisons. You have a contaminated jury. Mm-hmm. Um, any any of the evidence that would have proven that this was an act of self defense was deemed was deemed um, objectionable or irrelevant to the case. What I say, stated earlier about the confession by of Michael Richardson of these guards being a part of the Ku Klux Klan mm-hmm. was not stated in the in in the trial. Wow. And the fact that Lincoln Love was beaten up, um if you know anything about law when you talk about self defense, it's about the uh state of the state of mind of someone is very important to proving self defense. Like was that person acting under the under the guise of self defense either for themselves or what's called the um acting in in the defense of a third person. Um but they say since they didn't see the see the beating that that didn't that didn't justify it because they didn't see it, um, and ultimately they're it's an all white jury. Don't want to forget that mm-hmm. it's an all white jury. There were only two black people in the original pool, and they got kicked out. One of them got kicked out over a parking ticket. <laughs> um, it's an all white jury in a county that is a deep clan history, obviously, and ultimately they did get. Um, um, Balagoon got 84 years, sentenced 84 years, and Naeem was sentenced to 142 years. Jesus. Balagoon's 84 years were four cases of of criminal confinement and bodily harm, and then Naeem got those same four cases of criminal confinement plus attempted murder, bodily harm, and rioting. And you know that's why we say they have over 200 plus years combined. Both of them got de facto life sentences in a situation in which no one died. Hmm. in a situation in which um, they actually went out of the way to protect people in a situation where they saved a man's life because that man would have died that day um, had they not talking about Lake of Love had they not um, intervened and you know they they went on to be persecuted afterwards they were in solitary confinement um, they were they, they basically the state of Indiana builds its first supermax prison four years after their trial I believe uh, at Westfield Correctional Facility uh, what's called the uh, Maximum the MCC, um, and that's where they were forced to go on hunger strike, and then they were sent to the SHU, the security housing unit, and um, and I think Balagoon spent 32 years in solitary confinement. Oh, my God. And, um, and Naeem spent over uh, roughly 20 years in solitary confinement. Wow. Um, they're both back in population now. Obviously, these are older gentlemen. We're talking about men in their mid-60s now. Mm-hmm. Um, they have different health challenges that just come and if anyone knows about prison, the medical neglect that comes, the prisons cut their their um, any kind of health care to a bare minimum yeah. to to save costs. And in the case of their in the case of these two gentlemen, I, it's also another way of torturing them. 
uh, while they were on solid Terror, they were tortured. They were, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about what happened in solid area, whether we're talking about sensory deprivation, uh, whether we're talking about the beatings that go on, whether we're talking about the food being useless, uh, whether we're talking about a windowless cell, talking about people left outside in the cold. I mean, there's all kinds of things we can get into on that. Um, but yeah, that's the case. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking to hear it. Um, but I don't want people to walk away thinking that this cannot be transformed. Uh, that's not the point here. The point is to, is, is advocate for these brothers because again, this is, this kind of stuff is allowed to, to happen because often these things are swept under the rug or people are distracted by other things. Um, and you know, we've organized a defense committee to advocate for their release and to raise a broader awareness about political prisoners because we do say they are political prisoners because they clearly got this this level of sentencing because they rose up against the state because they rose up against clan members because they that the example that they set is an example that you know the state of Indiana and the broader you know U.S. state does not want to be uh, perpetuated so the punishment had to be steep. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll close there because I know that was a lot of information. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's it's not a total surprise to anybody who knows anything about the history of prisons and the racism inherent within them and the torture of, of solitary confinement, which is, by any reasonable measure, cruel and unusual punishment. It's a form of medieval torture. It, it's, it's a violation of any coherent idea of, of human rights, um, and it still goes on to this very day. This third time they came down in a matter of hours. They ride gear, you know, and this and that. Now they lined up outside no more cell. Now keep in mind, you didn't pass up four or five more cells, but you had no more cell. We in the middle. You got some more cells before you get to us. Why you lined up outside that brother's cell? As I seen him going to no more cell, he didn't see what I seen on the side of the wall. It was some more guards lined up, sticks, Shields, helmets, you know, ready to do battle. They lined up, man, they got, uh, looked like guns and, and all type of stuff. They went in on the brother, had him subdued, had him handcuffed. And what really caused this bride this particular day, once he was handcuffed, one of the guards took the sticks and hit him in his head. Blood gash out of his head. I'm right there, I got tears in my eyes because I tell him, look, give me some of that just to take them off of him. So one of the guards said, don't worry about it. Y'all got some of that coming. You know what I mean? He said, it was seven. So I look over there, no blood gushing out of the brother's head, cuffed behind his back, man. They defeated them into a pass for the, for the solid oak club. As they beat him, they drug him out of his cell and then drug him down the range of the kill, he did, uh, the, the kill of the range for all the other prisoners to see. And everybody thought he was dead. They thought he was dead. Hey, man, somebody go uh, tell, hey, man, they're trying to kill us down here. Once John Coleman got the word of what's taking place, somewhere down that line, him and his brother named Christopher Trotter met up. So now they come and trying to see what's going on in this particular unit. Um, we interviewed uh, Black Panther Kevin Rasheed Johnson a couple years ago, which I'll link to in the show notes as well, and... He was in prison when we're talking to him and he talks about, yeah, just having like, you know, in the cell, having dogs set on him before a bunch of cops in full armor come in and and brutalize him. So he's fighting a dog and then getting beaten by all these other cops talks about the deep racism within it. But I think one of the things that people might some I mean, maybe be surprised. I mean, my audience probably is not, but the general public would be is that they're these correction officers, as you mentioned, form gangs themselves. And um, and the the guard unit that you're talking about, the Sons of Light, are a KKK affiliated um, gang. And so my my follow up question is, if you can talk a little bit more about that, and then um, love his was he was targeted explicitly for his work. Was there nothing else going on that that resulted in this acute situation? Was it just a a planned attack by by these racist guards against love? And then and then what was love's injuries when everything when the smoke cleared? How how brutalized was was that man? Yeah, well, there. If you read the guards' account, they'll say it was a retaliation for a prior incident. Like there, the Michael Richardson again in a deposition says, like some one of the guards, I think it was Wicker, slammed something on the table and said, "This is for so and so," because uh, uh, because Lincoln Love had got into it with a, uh, another guard uh, weeks prior. Mm. 
Uh, because again, they they view this as a war, and I think it's important if anyone's familiar with like Tip of the Spear or Sami Burns work mm-hmm. um, to think about that's what you're 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 under you're under siege, and you're at war um, with these guards who are constantly you know brutalizing you. So um, Lincoln Love he did survive that day uh, despite those um, despite the brutality that he that he had to live with. Um, he, he was brought back into the cell and after that was all done, they put him back in the maximum restraint unit and nothing was changed in that sense. He went on to live for, um, I think up until COVID and he passed, he passed due to COVID. Mm. Like that was, that was how that all ended. Uh, in terms of the sons of light. Yeah. That, that group, again, it's never been, never been uh, there was some kind of fbi investigation that that we but we've never been able to recover like that's not a public those aren't public documents so whatever the fbi found i mean the fbi you take that with a grain of salt obviously but mm-hmm. whatever the fbi found they did not uh release um uh, but there was there was someone from prison one guard that did go to prison for violating um the civil rights of lincoln love but other than that there was no real retribution obviously nobody got anything equivalent to life like yeah. uh you know like 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 Balagood and Naeem got in terms of the Sons of Light just to speak up a little bit further um this is this is directly from the deposition and um M- Mike Richardson was asked about the uh, the situation Said everybody, he said every beating I've seen on any inmate there has been has been totally uncalled for. There's never been a weapon, and the ones that have been there that have been beaten only one time. I've gotten combination on my packet where an inmate had a weapon and took it from him, and then the inmate decided he was going to fight. So that so then we fought, but that's the only time. So again, most of the time there wasn't a direct reason to do this. You know, even this payback thing I was talking about that's not how this is supposed to work, right? right? If you're a guard that works at the prison, payback's not supposed to be how you work. That, to your point, shows they're operating like a gang. He says, um, this is later in the deposition, they ask him, are you aware of any racially motivated groups that, of any of the guards that any of the guards belong to? And that's when he says, the Sons of Light. They say, what do you know about them? He says, it's a group of lieutenants, captains, sergeants that belong to this, that use the KKK. KKK literature and the same type of rituals. They are a splinter group. They're not affiliated. They don't pay dues. It's developed solely for the institution. Hmm. He said, and then the question was, what's their purpose? And he says directly, well, they hate niggers. They hate Jews. They hate Catholics. That's what it was explained to me. Hmm. Um, and then he later goes on to talk about how his kid was babysat by uh, Captain Sands. And he said, our children used to be babysat by him and played with his clan robe. And he carries a card. He's involved in it. That's the captain, which is all, which is over all the captains of the institution. So it's also important to note this is not a low level thing because there's this caricature sometimes about the this kind of racist that they are stupid and disorganized and um, ignorant and backwards. And you know, liberals like to think of think of that's the only kind of racism that exists. And I don't. I think we're wrong when we think of the right wing or the fascists as just these hillbilly idiots. No, no, these are deeply organized people. Regardless of what we, obviously we don't agree with their views, but these are deeply organized people and and, and you saw in this case they're heading the, the entire prison in, in many cases. So it's like, um, so that was, that was the Sons of Light um, and I can't remember if there was any other part of your question I might have been missing no, that I no, need to speak to. No, you definitely spoke to all that, and I definitely want to emphasize the, the liberal naivete and the caricature of what what a racist is. And it's of course this. It comes from this predominant, comfortable liberal position where they're totally detached from the realities of organized fascist and racial violence in the history of the United States. So they just think it's like these yeah hillbillies out in the middle of nowhere burning a cross, and it's not these incredibly snake like well integrated into the major institutions of society um, with some of them, like any movement will have 
its rank and file, and then we'll also have its intellectual leaders, its organizational leaders, et cetera. And that's no different on the radical right. And um, so I think it's important. Yep. It's important to bring up. You know, I think the brutality of that of that beating on on love, or you know, rest in peace. Um, and just after the smoke clears and you have to go back to to solitary and then just spend weeks just recovering from a brutal, brutal beating. And, you know, there's no as you're talking about, no systematic health care, nobody that actually gives a fuck, nobody there trying to manage or relieve your pain or have any compassion towards you whatsoever. Um, you're just left to rot in a cell by yourself and just your body slowly heals and just the brutal process of that alone. Um, disgusting. But. Uh, the, another question I have is, of course, um, Cole and, and Trotter were given these brutal and insane sentences um, for doing in any what anybody with a reasonable brain would would conclude is a heroic and completely just <laughs> act. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, uh, and you said one one guard got a little punishment um, for violating civil rights. Were there other people that um, were involved in the uprising that actually got pris- uh, you know lengthy sentences but didn't quite reach the length of of Cole and Trotter? Yeah, I was talking about Charles Murphy. He's in the documentary under the name Minka. He got I think like an additional ten years or twelve. I can't remember the exact number. Mm. Um, but there, so it wasn't just those two, but those two were the leaders of it, and therefore those two got. Like uh, more than just the, the biggest chump they got basically all this time, you know, mm-hmm. relative to everyone else, because um, they were the ones that took the most risk, so they got the most penalties, right? Right. Uh, but they weren't the only ones involved. No, I mean that's why I was emphasizing about this Black Dragons group that was a unit of of um, black prisoners that really was trying to unify any prisoners that got with the program, and often they would try to stop other prisoners from fighting each other. Mm. They would try to stop other prisoners from, you know, getting into skirmishes because they were like, look, the guards are our real enemy. This institution is our real enemy. Mm. And and this this group, the Black Dragons, <clears throat> the Black Dragons doesn't, if you don't have a group like that, I don't think you have the uprising. I think Lincoln probably just dies because, or he's just murdered on that night because, or that morning because there wouldn't have been a all kind of coordinated sense of, oh, we need to do something. Mm-hmm. It was it was spontaneous in the sense that it was not <clears throat> planned. But again, I think this is where spontaneity is misunderstood. And also, or it's always burden to keep referencing his work, um, did a good job of, you know, pushing back about this in terms of Attica. Like, you have to have some kind of pre-existing organization to even be able to respond, quote unquote, spontaneous, in a spontaneous way. Yeah to a a situation like that if you don't have it often what happens is that that the the bd just goes off goes on and people might be abhorred by it but they don't know what to do because they don't have any training they don't have any bonds they don't have any love for this person they're just kind of thrown off by the visceral scene of it but because these men had established those things in a pre-existing way they knew to call it down to population they knew we need to go check out when Valley Moon comes in and tells people what's going on, they knew they had to go protect their brother. Like those kind of communal bonds that people talk about all the time out here that often is just rhetoric. They actually established those things. So they were ready to respond. You know, if you if you play this out on the other side of the fence, you know, outside of prison, we often don't have that. And that's not solely our fault. Obviously, the state is repressed and bought off a lot of that. But we don't have that to respond in the same way. So in the documentary... Something my call director set up, I think, really well was a question of George Floyd when he was be- being beaten up. And, um, you know, he asked what I would what I've been willing to intervene. And I always say most people are not going to intervene in a situation like that because they don't have that kind of pre-established relationship. We're all strangers watching men get beat. We're probably not going to do anything because we don't have any organization in place. Right. These men did. So they knew that's our brother. We're not going to let him go to, go out like that. And we're going to stand up, and you know, not even Valerie Moon led that charge, um, but but yeah, other people did receive penalties. Mm. They were, like I said, they were in the hole and stuff like that, but not not for thirty two or twenty years. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah, of course, given the huge amount of of the years in those sentencings, those two sentences are still ongoing. Whereas I'm sure a lot of them have already passed because this happened in 1985 mm-hmm. initially. But your point about organization is so crucial. The organization is essential 
um, before anything pops off because when something pops off, that organization immediately knows how to respond to it in an organized fashion. And when you don't have that, when it's pure spontaneity, then it quickly, even if you could form a mob in a moment, afterwards it quickly relegates everybody back to their individual um, individualism, their individual concerns. You know, I don't want to step out. I don't want to be the one that's that's taken for this. And an organization is a, is a great way to combat that and to continue the struggle afterwards, right? Because there is the uh, acute act of, of trying to save love's life. And then there's the political fallout from that, that that also needs organization to respond to and navigate in the coming months and years afterwards. To this very day, organization is bringing the the uh, cause of the Pendleton to to the to uh, to the forefront of a brand new generation of organizers and activists and radicals and so that organization is really ongoing. You mentioned earlier that the Black Dragons were a um, organizational offshoot of the Black Guerrilla family um, founded by George Jackson. Um, can you say just a little bit about George Jackson and and uh, the in, the creation of the Black Guerrilla family and what the sort of idea and and goals behind that were? So yeah, George Jackson was a was a political prisoner, a revolutionary, and um, in that was out of that was based in the California prisons of San Quentin. He was um, he comes to prominence actually after in 1970, um, there was an assassination um, of his friend W. O. Nolan, um, 21 year old uh, Alvin Juggs, and um, Cleveland Edwards by prison guards after an altercation with the Aryan nation. Um, mm. There was, after this altercation, the, um, the, these two, three brothers who eventually were killed had responded to the Aryan nation and they were basically beating them up. And then the guards killed those three brothers. Cause they were again, speaking about being in pact with like these white supremacist groups. Mm. Uh, four days later, there was a prison guard, after that that was beaten up and thrown over the tier and then this is where george jackson and uh two other brothers uh fleeta uh drumgol and blind Clouchet, um later known as the soledad brothers they were um they were accused for this retaliation and now they were they were on they were they were being persecuted so from here there was a defense committee that actually was formed for george jackson um, and this is why Angela Davis eventually gets involved. Mm. We we really didn't know much about Angela Davis up to this point other than her being persecuted due to being a communist professor. She gets on his case, um, learns about it through her own organizing efforts, and then eventually um, Jonathan, or Jonathan Jackson, George Jackson's brother, uh, tries to take over a... Uh, he tries to break his brother out of prison. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten this for the sake of time. I could get into more details. Yeah. Tries to, tries to break his brother out of prison. He's killed by the state as well as the judge. He takes hostage. These guns are then assumed to be Angela Davis's, and they say that she was part of this, and that's how she ends up on the top 10 most wanted and becomes this national or international figure. That's how we come to know her. She also, I, I believe, had fallen in love with George Jackson. That's, that's She's admitted to that, and that's in the, if you actually read the letters, in Soledad Brothers, it's in the actual letters. Mm. Um, so George Jackson then becomes eventually a field marshal. Huey P. Newton get, uh, makes him a field marshal of the of the Black Panther Party from inside prison, and that's where he, he so again you get Soledad Brothers, and you get the blood in your blood in my eye, which was even more direct in its in its um in its goals. Um, but they say that George Jackson was trying to break out of prison. This story is really hard to believe, but they say he tried to sneak a gun into his afro or a fake afro. And he was trying to escape, and then he gets shot. Mm. So he, we say he was assassinated. Absolutely. Um, and to again to speed this up, the well before we get to that, that's but during this time is when George Jackson founded the Black Black Gorilla Family. You know that was that was during the time that he founded it, mm. and that was that was directly. Uh, <clears throat> That was directly to have organization within prison because George Jackson, you know, was deeply, deeply studied like Marxist Leninism and understood like we we're talking about the need for organization. Yeah. Um, so prisoners had their own internal structure and organization. And these organizations didn't just exist in California, but they existed across the nation. And in since that you had an organization internally in prison that if a revolutionary got locked up or something of that nature, 
that organization was there to to receive them, take care of them, protect them, et cetera, right? Mm. Uh, and they're doing political education classes. They're working out. You know, they're preparing themselves for war. They're preparing themselves for a struggle. That's why during Black August, you know, we talk about study, train, fast, organize. Like, that's where that tradition comes from. Mm. Um, so, again, just, I could go on further, but that's that's kind of the – that's that's how we get George Jackson, and then Black August is founded after he's assassinated. Is founded uh, eight years later in 1979 when people met outside of California state prisons to um, have a commemoration, and and from there we honor Black political prisoners in Black August as well as the many different uh, revolutionary dates and activities that occurred in the month of August. Whether we're talking about the Haitian Revolution, um, the Watts Rebellion. Um, uh, Marcus Garvey's birthday, uh, James Baldwin was born in August, um, and so on and so forth. Beautiful. There's a lot of different dates, but again, for the sake of time, I won't put in all those. Yeah. Yeah, no, George Jackson is is absolutely, a, you know, a, a hero, somebody that everybody on the radical revolutionary, um, you know, black liberatory and socialist anti-imperialist left should read. We've done a series in the past on George Jackson's famous book, Blood in My Eye, which is this radical revolutionary analysis of United States society that still resonates and it still rings 100 percent true to this very day. Um, and it was very much of a perspective shift for for me and my own political development when I came across Blood in My Eye and, you know, imbibed its lessons. Um, but it's beautiful that his legacy still lives on. Uh, it's beautiful that Black August still lives on in your work and, and the work of so many others around the country is, you know, you can trace a, a direct line um, back to the Black Panthers, back to, back to uh, George Jackson, et cetera. So um, it's, it's really cool to see that all these years later and new generations are coming to back to these texts, uh, you know, learning these stories, learning about these figures yeah. and being inspired by them. Um, that's a beautiful, well, beautiful yeah. thing. Well, um, I want to kind of shift here and talk about n- now that we know the backstory, I wanted to say that you have just released an interview with Naeem Trotter on your podcast, the Black Myths podcast, so people can go listen to that first person account of, of what happened and, and hear even more of this backstory, which I highly, highly encourage people to do. There's a wonderful documentary that you helped um, produce. on. It's free on YouTube, put out by Breakthrough News, um, which I'll link to in the show notes as well and probably play a clip from so people can go and watch a whole documentary and just continue to educate themselves on the situation so that they can um, contribute to it. And with that in mind, can you let listeners know where they how they can help out or directly contribute to this struggle um, for the Pendel- Pendleton 2 and just sort of your work around it and how people can support that? Yeah, just a few things. The documentary was actually uh, co-directed by myself and uh, mm-hmm. King Trill. We put it out through Breakthrough News, but that was actually internally produced by the Defense Committee. I just nice. want to clarify that. Nice. Uh, um, in terms of how people can help, again, there's all the links are in the show notes, um, but we're trying to raise because they're still in prison and there's more to this story. Um, one thing they've never really had, uh, in my opinion, is sufficient counsel. Actually, it was ruled that Naeem had literally insufficient counsel in his first trial that the judge actually ruled that when he later tried to get his sentence vacated, which was well also ridiculous because he got it vacated and they removed the judge, put a new judge on the on the bench. And he was resentenced to 122 years. Mm. Like, this is, you know, just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but they never really had sufficient legal counsel because a lot of lawyers don't really want to touch cases like this, obviously. Um, so we're trying to raise money to get them sufficient legal counsel. We are, have, we are making some inroads on that. I can't say everything right now just for, because of legal reasons, but, um, but we need to have the money to on hand to pay them. And for people who maybe can't get involved directly in the defense committee or in, you know, the publicity of their case or anything of that nature, a donation would be greatly appreciated. Um, so you can go to the Chuff link that's in the that's in the show notes or you can directly send it through Cash App or Venmo. We have we have uh, ways of taking up money in from all those different sources. So definitely want to want to push that because, again, um, it's we, we hear a lot of sympathy when we talk about this case and people feel sad and hurt and that's all well and good but you know materially they need things that help them get out mm. so if you can donate if you have it if you don't have it totally understand but if you have it you know that'd be really helpful yeah 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, if you don't have it, um, you know, you can spread the word. You can you can share conversations like this. You can go listen to the Black Mist podcast, share it with friends. If you're in an organization, make sure that that organization maybe centers this issue, especially if you're in the you know the area of Indiana and in Indianapolis. Um, but yeah, sharing it, perpetuating it, pushing it around, going and watching the documentary, sharing that with comrades is essential. But if you can donate anything at all, I think that is really, really absolutely crucial um, and, and goes towards a, a great cause because, you know, you're right. This this makes you feel heartbroken and anger and rage. And then just to turn away and just turn off the, the radio or turn off your, your phone and go about your day. Um, there's something just that that's not right about that. So do whatever you can um, within your own capacities. Only you know what those are. Um, but helping out is essential. And I will link to the donation and, and all the ways you can donate um, prominently in the show notes for people to immediately go and do just that. Um, you did talk about Black Hawk. I will say yeah. uh, just real quickly a few other things I didn't say. If people want to host screenings, like we also like will send some of our people out. Sometimes I'll, I'll come out or my co-director or others will come out and we'll like if you want to host a screening like locally. Um, we'll come out through Zoom if there's a budget. This is another way of raising money. If you have access to university budgets or access to uh, organizational budgets that have a little bit of money, you can pay us a screening fee. We use that as a way of, you know, raising money for the campaign as well. And then also people can sign petitions for their release. I just want to make sure I say all the different options that people have. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, really important. And I'll make sure those are laid out in the show notes um, as obviously and easily to access as, as possible. What What is the exact organization that's doing work around the Pendleton 2? Uh, the, the organization is named the Defense Committee to Free the Pendleton Two, or the Defense Committee uh, for the Pendleton Two. And then there's other affiliate organizations like uh, the uh, IDOC Watch, uh, that's the Indiana Department of Corrections Watch, and then uh, Focus Families, which focuses on reentry programming. Okay. Cool. So there's different, and then also Black Lives for Peace. It's just recently, my organization has recently got involved in the campaign. So cool. Yeah, Black Alliance of Peace. Of course, we've had many members on. Um, from that organization over the years, one of the, you know, one of the best organizations in the United States, um, in my opinion. So anybody that can join that in any way, show solidarity, support the Black Alliance for Peace, um, really, really crucial. Um, and you were mentioning Black August, you were talking a little bit about it, but before we wrap up, um, this we're at the tail end of August, we're going to try to get this out just as August ends. Um, can you talk about the the Black August events of this year, how things went, and then, you know, maybe how people can, can plug in for, for next year? Uh, yeah, this year we did a week of uh, Black August events. We just finished those. Um, as of Sunday, we had a book talk, the off the book I was talking about earlier, Launder Black Rage. More so, that book talk was just to solely raise money for the campaign. So we we gave all the, all the books that got sold there and went stri- strictly to the campaign. Mm. Um, then we did a letter writing event. Then we did a Black August art event. Then we had a rally. Um, and then we also were part of a film festival, the Indianapolis Black Documentary Film Festival. Um, so we showed the film there. So um, those events, you know, there's always more to be had. But those events, I went, think overall, went pretty well. Uh, we were able to, you know, sign more petitions, raise more money, and just bring more awareness to their case, which is, you know, highly important. Um, so we're just trying to base build to a level that, you know, we can we can uh, build enough support to where as pressure is applied to prosecutors and governors there, they recognize that there is a constituency of people that want their relief. Yeah. That's absolutely crucial. It's essential. Um, how can people join up or, or support the black Alliance for peace? Black Alliance for peace. You can go to the website, uh, black Alliance for peace.com and just, um, you can sign, if you want to become a member, uh, you can, you know, black folks can become members in it. People who are black and become solidarity members, you can still join just under a different capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can sign up and join through that, or you can donate as well. So. Awesome. And I'll make sure I, I throw the links in the show notes as well for that. Um, so, yeah, support that in any way you can. Again, I think Black Alliance for Peace is doing really, really crucial work. And the more people that are behind it, supporting it in solidarity with it, um, the better. And every single member of the Black Alliance for Peace that I've ever talked to are some of the most principled, sober-minded, clear-eyed, um, and truly revolutionary uh, comrades that I've been able to come in contact with. So uh, that says a lot about the organization. Uh, before I let you go to Black, uh, can you just remind listeners that they can find all of your work, uh, your book, and your podcast online? Yeah, the um, 
Uh, the book Wandering Black Rage is uh you know it's available. It's it's uh, if you're gonna get it right now, this this is it's a pricey book, unfortunately. So it's available on sale right now. Rutledge is running some kind of twenty percent discount or something. Or I would say I don't like to push Amazon, but I think it actually is cheap right Amazon, mm. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I'm all for people getting it as cheap as they can. Um, uh, so they can find that. Just type in Laundering Black Rage: The Washing of of Black death, people, property, and profits, and it will pop up. Um, you can read it in whatever capacity. I've heard it's floating out there in other forums, but I can't publicly endorse that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you do what you got to do. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> um, so you can find it there. You can find me uh, to to hyphen black dot com. Uh, you can t o o hyphen b l a c k dot com. The book's available on there. I'm also a performing poet, um, so people can find me through that. Um, and, and what was the what, was it me or the podcast. What, what was the other question? Podcast. Yeah. Oh, sometimes I forget all these things. <laughs> uh, and if anyone listen to Black Myths podcast, Black Myths podcast, we we take myths about us uh, of a social political nature about Black people. Said, uh, said about them or related to black folks and we debunked them um, so we just did one at Black August is a celebration with that's the myth with uh, Naeem Trotter um, you know we do various myths um, uh, we did one a little less a little more lighthearted but actually found some da- really damaging information so that wasn't very lighthearted in the, in the long run we did one about the uh, the, the myth that, that it uh, was about X-Men it was about the, that um Professor X and uh, and uh, Tra- and uh, Professor X and Magneto were based upon Malcolm X and or Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, which is not true. Mm. But we actually found in that episode when we did the research that they were based that those characters were actually they were not based on those civil rights or human rights leaders, but they were based on um, on Zionist uh, heads of state. Jesus. That that's actually what they based them on. Wow. Uh, so, <laughs> oh my God. So. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in learning about that, go check out that episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they can find that on um, any of the any of your, any app you listen to podcast on. You also on uh, Black Liberation Media on YouTube. Uh, we're part of a broader collective. You can find us on YouTube as well. Cool. Yeah, Black Liberation Media on YouTube. Go subscribe to it. Show some love. And then yeah, if you haven't already downloaded and subscribed to Black Myths Podcast, definitely do so. If you're listening to a podcast like this, you're you're definitely going to be interested in a podcast like that. Um, so, so go subscribe to that and thank you to black for all your amazing work. I really, I mean, hats off to you and to all the comrades working on this issue and to everything that you do with political education and organizing. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on. And of course, you're welcome back here anytime. I appreciate it. Thank you.